I'd like to invite our second panel up. And before we get started, just want to introduce a couple of uh, very key people within the administration. Uh, one is standing right here to my right, Maddie Stanislaus. Uh, Maddie is the Assistant Administrator for Solid Waste and Emergency Response. Maddie has done a phenomenal job uh, for this administration. And, and I think one of the great things about an event like this is the connections that all of us can make between sectors, between government and private industry. And, and hopefully, you've had a chance to meet uh, some of the great folks at EPA, including Maddie. So Maddie, thanks for being here. Uh, a couple of other people I wanted to introduce. One is uh, on our public engagement team, Kyle Learman. Kyle uh, is up here on the left. Kyle is the sports outreach director, amongst many other things that he does at the White House. And uh, as we connect uh, to the sports industry and, and all of our franchises and the leagues, uh, Kyle is really the point person for that. And then uh, I'd be remiss not to introduce uh, somebody on my team, uh, Eli Levine, who really has been the driver behind this event. And uh, luckily, Eli showed up today. L luckily, Eli showed up today. I was, I was a little bit worried that, you know, at the White House, we were all wearing ties and suits and whatnot. And Eli is a huge New York Rangers fan. And so I thought he was going to be here. I, I thought he was going to be here in his Mike Richter jersey. Luckily, he, uh, he stuck with the tie and the suit. So to introduce our first panel and, and our moderators, I, I wanted to uh, turn it over to uh, uh, two distinguished uh, guests of ours, Martin Tull, who I uh, spoke about earlier. Martin's done a fantastic job in, in uh, running the Green Sports Alliance here over the last couple of years. He manages the overall operations of the alliance, oversees all of the environmental aspects, the reduction strategies, the alliances, the membership programs. And uh, he really led the formation and growth of the alliance uh, through the founding of six pro sports teams to now uh, over 40 partners and, and, and many others. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, Martin, for being here. And then our second moderator, our co-moderator, uh, is Dr. Dave Danielson. Uh, Dave is a dynamic force at the Department of Energy. Uh, he leads the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, as Assistant Secretary, uh, Dr. Danielson oversees a broad portfolio that's uh, intended to hasten the transition to a clean energy economy. So uh, Dave, uh, why don't you take it away? Great. I think we'll just stay seated, keep it informal here. Does that sound good? Great. Uh, well, thanks for that, and thanks to CEQ for bringing us all together. I'm excited to be here today, um, and I'm you know, excited to be here co-moderating with Martin Toll of the Green Sports Alliance. Um, one thing that you should know is the names of our softball teams at DOE. It's really important. Uh, one is named, you know, you know our Secretary of Energy, his name is Stephen Chu. And so they've called one of the teams Big League Chew, which I like. <laughs> and the other one's a little more geeky and wonky. The EERE team, which is the clean energy office that I run, uh, we have a, a team called Combined Heat and Power, which I like. <laughs> uh, so my office, the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the DOE, is really uh, the clean energy office within uh, DOE, and we're really at the core uh, of the administration's push uh, for us to, for the United States to be, you know, the leader in the transition to a global clean energy economy. Um, really excited to be sitting with, with the folks uh, in, the, in the sports community here. Uh, I was thinking the other day as I you know, travel a lot uh, in my position, and as you fly over the country and you look down, you know, what do you see that, that let's say that you're an, you're an alien coming to this, uh, <laughs> coming to this world from, from somewhere else, and you look down and you say, what, what is important? What are the important structures in this society? And I really look at it as that these stadiums we have are, are incredibly important cultural icons. And so, you know, not only are, are stadiums uh, for sports teams, you know, a, you know, significant energy users and opportunities for efficiency and deployment of renewable energy and advanced vehicle technologies like electric vehicles, you know, uh, there are also these really important cultural icons for the country and for the world. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for, uh, for these, uh, these stadiums and these sports teams uh, to, do what, to continue to do what they're already doing and use this as, as an opportunity for, to introduce the American people to the idea of clean energy as something that's incredibly important for the country for a number of different reasons, you know, for American economic well-being, American leadership uh, in, in the global economy, uh, for pushing, uh, you know, uh, for an environmentally superior energy uh, solution for all of us. Um, and so I think there's a really great opportunity 
not only for us to make change happen in terms of uh, <laughs> deploying technologies, advanced technologies into these facilities, but also as they have an opportunity to really get the word out to the American people about uh, how exciting the, the, the clean energy economy is and, and that it's a great opportunity for Americans to really lead the world. Um, couple, you know, we have made some, we are partnering with the, uh, with Green Sports Alliance through our Better Buildings Challenge, which is a presidential initiative to reduce energy use in buildings uh, by 20% by 2020. This is an, uh, really a good example of, of the White House and the Department of Energy kind of using uh, the, the, the bully pulpit to put out a challenge to the country and have the private sector really step up and respond. You know, we have uh, more than 70 partners here, Starbucks, Walmart, City of Philadelphia, uh, City of LA and a whole bunch of others uh, who've made this commitment and we've had now a commitment of more than 2.5 billion dollars of private capital to go uh, retrofit these facilities. So I think there's, it, we should all be reminded of the power of this convening authority and there may be a great opportunity for those of us up here to, to take advantage of that as well. And one specific example, just to throw it out there, uh, of, of activity that's, that's happening in, in the sports world that, that we've supported and uh, is is in St. Louis Cardinals Bush Stadium, where uh, the, the EERE, my office, is one of many examples, just to throw it out there. Uh, Bush Stadium uh, installed a steam heat recovery uh, technology that's, that's saving them more than 5 million gallons of water and 440,000 kilowatt hours of electricity a year. And so, you know, that's just one example of what we're doing, and we want to do a lot more of this uh, going forward. Um, I'm really excited to, to learn about what folks on the panel are doing, and I'm even more excited to be a really close partner with each of you uh, and your leagues to really uh, try to get the clean energy economy accelerated even faster than it's going today and try to get the word out about the opportunity we have as a clean energy, uh, uh, as a country in clean energy. Um, you wanted to say a few words? Sure, absolutely. Thanks very much. Well. Um you know, as the executive director of the Green Sports Alliance, I've had the chance to work very closely with um, at least most of the folks on the, on the panel and uh, been able to also work with many of the other teams and organizations uh, here in attendance today. Um, I've seen, you know, firsthand how significant many of these environmental initiatives are that they've been doing, and they really do stand as shining examples uh, for teams and venues uh, here in this country as well as worldwide. Um, you know, I do want to mention that kind of beyond the great work of the, this, this best-in-class panel that's assembled here today, there literally are hundreds of sports organizations worldwide that are working to improve their operations. And um, many of them have the support and encouragement of their, their league offices as well. Uh, just a little quick history of the, the alliance. Uh, since our public launch in uh, March of 2001, we have grown to include over 50 professional and collegiate member teams. Uh, and over 100 sports venues. Um, these members together represent more than 13 leagues, professional and collegiate. Um, as, a, as an alliance of member teams and partners, we work with these sports teams to try to understand the environmental performance of their facilities, share strategies and resources with them, uh, helping them to lower their operating costs and reduce their environmental footprint. Uh, we're very fortunate to have the support and technical resources of many of the agencies here, uh, the Natural Research Defense Council, the US EPA, DOE, and others. Uh, all as, as partners for the Alliance. Um, I hope that the discussion today will encourage uh, other teams and leagues that may have been watching from the sideline to get in the game, start tracking their environmental performance, and then uh, work to try to make it better like the, these great panelists have today. Um, let me go ahead and introduce the, the panel and we'll hear some of their, their detailed stories. Um, on the far right, we have Leonard Bonacci, Vice President of Event, Event Operations for the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, we have uh, Scott Jenkins, who is the uh, Vice President of Operations for the Seattle Mariners and also serves as the Chairman of the Board of the Green Sports Alliance. Um, we have Jackie Ventura, Operations Coordinator for American Airlines Arena and the Miami Heat. Uh, Joe Abernathy is the Vice President of Operations for Bush Stadium. And uh, also I have Justin Zollner, Director of Sustainability and Planning for the Portland Trailblazers and the Rose Quarter. So we've got a really great, great group today. Um, Let's see, Dave, would you like to start it off? Or, yeah, I thought uh, we'd, we'd throw it out uh, a couple of questions each to the panel. And, you know, some of the questions may, be, may not be relevant for everyone, but just invite everyone to respond to the questions that are of relevance. The first one I wanted to throw out is on the energy efficiency side. You know, I uh, wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about some of the energy efficiency measures that you've taken and the motivation 
and what the, 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 uh, the actual return on investment has looked like in terms of whether it's economic or, or otherwise, we we'll just encourage you to talk about some of your energy efficiency investments. Maybe we'll start with Leonard. Well, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, Philadelphia is a really you know, privilege to be part of a group like this and uh, to contribute a little bit in this movement. Um, to start, you know, back in 2003, coincidentally how small this world is, uh, Scott Jenkins, uh, to my left here, uh, was our vice president at the time and opened Lincoln Financial Field together. Um, so this is essentially my green teacher next to me, so I got to do well here. So um, we were we were real excited about being a green stadium. Our ownership is, is really behind it. So uh, as the golden rule states, who has the gold rules? So we decided we will go that direction. Um, and then we got our first power bill, which was uh, just over a quarter million dollars uh, for the month, and uh, quickly knocked our socks off and figured out we have to get really good really fast. Uh, and we did things as technologically advanced as our building automation system and our Lutron lighting system and different things like that. Um, to as non-technical as attaching a clipboard to an intern uh, following a game and making sure the over 1,000 TVs are turned off and, and just little things like that. So it's in layers. There was no one big swing we took at it. Um, there were some bigger projects that had larger impact than others, but uh, through all of that, uh, over the course of time, we were able to cut our energy usage in half, uh, you know, from uh, just over, I think it was 24 uh, million uh, kilowatts a year to uh, 13, just over 13. So, um, you know, we only have 10 events a year, uh, probably closer to 30 when you factor in everything, but uh, my friends in baseball and basketball and hockey have a lot more than we do. So um, that was one of the ways that we did, we did ours. That's great. Scott? Sure. Um, five years ago, six years ago now that I got to Seattle, um, I just took a look at our baseline data to see what we used for energy over, over a course of the building, and we're now 13 years old, so it was about halfway into the life of the building. And I just, you know, just again by metrics, seeing where we were in terms of year-on-year -year use, and I challenged my staff to try to find a new low water mark. Um, we had, you know, opened the building, things had settled down, um, but I thought there was opportunity there. And, and one of the ways to illuminate the opportunities was just to get people to think about um, what does it really cost us. And when you're running a building, um, it's a lot different than running your house. But you know, when you get your utility bill at the end of the month and you have to pay it, and it's been a hot month or a really cold month, it kind of smarts, right? And you usually like to shut the door, turn things off to try to minimize that. Well, in, the, in a ballpark, imagine with 2,000 employees and 40,000 people having a good time, how uh, invisible that bill is until you get it at the end of the month and someone pays it. So I just challenged my staff. I said, what do you think we pay on a daily basis? Um, and what if you got a $4,000 bill in the mail every day for energy and <laughs> utilities? You know, that would kind of hurt, right? So let's get smart about this and let's do the things at work that we do at home. Let's shut the, shut the lights off, let's turn equipment off, let's set the thermostat back, let's put aerators on the faucets. And in the first six months of just the behavioral change, we, we saved $100,000 and I was hoping to save 100 for the year. So clearly there was a new low water mark there that was, was readily achievable. And then we did some energy audits um, and did some investment in the building and was able to, to lower that further. So now we're, we're saving about $400,000 a year annually uh, from what we would have been spending had we not done the conservation. And uh, our energy intensity, uh, we use the EPA's Energy Star Portfolio Manager Program, and we're down about 25% uh, from six years ago. So when you look at the Better Building Challenge and you think about a 20% reduction, we've done 20, 25 so to everybody out there in the audience, um, you know, and we're in a place where a kilowatt hour costs you seven cents, a, uh, seven cents a kilowatt hour. So it's cheap energy. So if it makes economic sense for us to do it in the Pacific Northwest, imagine what it makes in Philadelphia or in New York or wherever utilities are higher. So it's truly the low hanging fruit is around energy uh, and, and water is much the same story. It's phenomenal. Uh, Jackie? Well, at the American Airlines Arena, um, we've been, open since 1999, New Year's Eve 1999, so we were a much older building, um, and we pursued LEED certification in the end of 2008, got the certification April 2009, and where we were really surprised was how efficient we were running our building. Um, when it came to things like electricity, um, we're running, when we did our baseline data, between 12 and 14 million kilowatt hours. So that goes to show we were already running at what you've been able to reduce to, which was amazing to us. When we did the Energy Star portfolio, buildings of our size were roughly 1.2 million square feet. 
um, run, we were running 53% more efficient, according to the EPA, than, an Energy Star, I'm sorry, than um, buildings of our size. And that automatically to us was a big crowning achievement. Um, a building that was 10 years old, um, that was able to run so efficiently. Um, if we had been running at what the Energy Star norm is, we would have been paying about $1.6 million more a year annually in energy cost alone. Our kilowatt hour is roughly the same as Scott's. Um, we average between five and seven cents a kilowatt hour and our demand also is very high. We've been able to meter our demand. Um, for those of you that don't know, demand is what you draw on electricity for 15 minutes consecutively, and that's what you're billed at as your high for the month. Um, we've been able to meter that in our show power rooms. We've been able to submeter um, those electrical rooms and see where hmm. we're hitting our peaks, where we can control. We've installed variable frequency drives on our largest air handlers, which are in our main bowl, so that we could do load shedding, we could do power monitoring, and that way we could scale back when we see that we are not trending that way. And all of that in itself has been able to show that we can be conservative and pass that on and show it to our fans so that hopefully we can continue the trend in the community. Water as well, we've, um, after installing aerators, after installing everything in our building is low flow, um, we've reduced our water bill, our potable water bill by about, by about 16 and a half percent since we became LEED certified and we're hoping to continue that trend, trying to move into waterless urinals hopefully in the future. And we've installed hot water boilers, high efficiency hot water boilers on gas. We've been able to reduce our gas to a third consumption of what it was um, back in 2009 when we achieved certification. So we're trying to keep all of these steps in play so that we can hopefully achieve recertification in the next year or so. And all of that, at the end of the day, energy efficiency equals fiscal responsibility, which I'm sure everyone on this panel will agree to. Um, it makes sense financially to be energy efficient and it's also good to show that to the public since we have such a huge reach into our community. Great. And, and Joe, I know you've been a real leader in trying to drive energy efficiency through baseball. What, uh, tell us some of the stories that you've got. Well, I, first off, we thank uh, the EPA for referencing one of our projects uh, that we did do, and, and it was uh, part of a, an overall effort that we made to try and improve our energy utilization uh, in the building. Um, you know, really for us, it was, it, it did come down to uh, efficiency of our operation and the, uh, the, the amount of money uh, it, we spend on to operate our building. Uh, we spend just short of $2 million a year on energy, both in electric and, and we have a steam loop that we buy our, our, uh, our heating uh, source from. And that ends up being close to 25% of my operating budget. So if we can make savings there, it goes right to the bottom line. Now, it's not going to pay for Albert Pulos, but <laughs> it, it, does, it, it does help. And certainly, I think it's all of our efforts, all of our responsibilities to, to, to be efficient and always try and find improvement. I've always been a big advocate of continuous improvement, and this whole process is just part of that. One of the things I would like to mention that uh, we found in on on our journey was the assistance that was available out there for energy efficiency projects is is amazing i mean our local utility had a pretty aggressive uh, business energy efficiency program uh, where they would allow uh, they would assist us in our energy uh, related projects uh, we had uh, uh, started with smaller things like uh, <coughs> occupancy sensors in, 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 in rooms to turn out lights, uh, reducing wattage on bulbs, the LED conversions. Uh, but even, we even got to the point where our local utility, Amber and UE, helped us pay for an energy audit, a full-blown um, energy audit that now is our roadmap for our energy improvements as we go forward. You know, we've identified that one in our steam plant. Uh, we have others that we're lining up as we look at our, you know, our chiller operation. We see opportunities there down the line. And so I would encourage those facilities out there, sport or non other, look to your local utility uh, for help in your energy efficiency programs. Look to the Department of Energy. I know the state of Missouri has programs that make it available. Uh, many of these projects, yeah, you do want to drive an ROI, but that ROI is tremendously assisted when you start taking some of the uh, assistance that's out there. Because at least a lot of these utilities are motivated to do that. Their logic is, if we can reduce the amount of energy we, they produce, 
that, that eliminates the future expansion of a power plant or maybe the addition of one, which costs those utilities quite a bit of capital. Mm -hmm. So they are in turn willing to spend that money and invest it in energy efficiency projects at their users to help them in their long range uh, approach on how they produce energy for our unit local area. So I, that was one of the great things that made it uh, uh, really a no-brainer for, 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 our, for our management to, to, to go forward with these projects because of the assistance that's out there uh, through utilities and other public agencies. Great. Justin? Uh, thank you for this great opportunity to be here today. I'm going to uh, play the role in this first question is uh, the cleanup hitter or in my industry, the sixth man. Um, and, uh, and connect the dots a little bit from the earlier panel and, and sort of the lead into to this. And I'm not going to bore you with the details of some of the energy efficiency modeling and, and projects that um, was, was laid out very well by our panelists. But I think in order to understand sort of um, this, the, this discussion today, some context is, is really required. A lot of you are here today, get our industry, some of you don't. Um, you know, we operate an arena um, in addition to being a professional sports team. So. Um, when we think about that, um, that impact is, is, is rather large. And we're, we're very grateful that we have public partners such as NRDC, the EPA, um, and the Department of Energy to help us think and navigate through these, these conversations. But we are also very grateful in talking about the earlier panel that we have senior leadership in this industry, such as our owner, Paul Allen, who is opening the doors for us to go towards and start thinking about these initiatives and objectives. Our chief operating officer, Sarah Mensa, she was here actually uh, earlier this year in the White House celebrating um, the, the role of um, women leadership in the sustainability movement. And we're very grateful to have the opportunities because they're allowing us to have this, this, this roadmap. So I, I, I talk about context because for, in order for us to understand our impact and what we have been able to achieve, what we've been able to do, we had to take an opportunity to kind of say, okay, what is our impact? What is our footprint? And so, um, just in relation to an arena, a couple hundred events a year, two million people enter our facility on an annual basis. We consume about 10 million kilowatt hours of power. We um, generate about two million pounds of waste a year. These are big impacts. When we actually looked at what um, we're, we're doing, we actually did a scope three analysis of carbon footprint, and we said, look, here's where we're at today, about 20,000 metric tons. Alan Hershkowitz said it very well earlier, once you start measuring these things and reporting these things, you start immediately making inroads about how you're going to eradicate your environmental impact and, and enhance your performance. We made some internal decisions to really think about being a climate positive organization. So we're actually thinking about that carbon footprint, eliminating it and actually going on and moving forward to be a positive impact to our community. So specific to energy, um, modeling. Uh, we have, we're, we're, we're part of the Better Buildings um, Challenge, uh, along with the Green Sports Alliance. We've reduced, since baselining everything in 2008, that carbon footprint, we've reduced our energy loads by over 30 percent. Um, we are saving now well over 2 million kilowatt hours on an annual basis. These are large numbers for us. Um, Scott mentioned 7 cents a kilowatt hour. We pay about 10 cents a kilowatt hour because right now we're offsetting all of our energy utilization through an offset through the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, which adds a premium to every kilowatt hour that we, um, that we consume. So we're really proud about that, but I want to give you some, um, a little bit of insight of that business case. So yeah, we're diverting waste at 90 percent and we're saving money there. We're, we're actually thinking about energy load, performance, et cetera. So all in all, we paid for consultants and we paid for lease certification, which were, were the only lead gold existing building professional sports venue in our industry worldwide, those things all cost money. Right around $500,000 is what we've invested since 2008. We've saved now well over a million. This is a very easy conversation to have when you think about it in the true sense of just the business case analysis itself. $500,000 spent a million in savings already, and that's just little short of, of about three years, actually, three and a half years. So we're very excited about this conversation today, and hopefully we'll be able to get into a little bit more of those specifics about the programs that we were able to do. Well, that's fantastic. And I think that uh, it's, a, it's a great segue into the uh, kind of a different angle on this. Some of these projects are really large, and they do take significant investment. They take partners. They take uh, a lot of planning, and you've got to really build this into your, your uh, development cycle. But some of these things that you found along the way are, are pretty surprising. 
Um, I, I know that I've heard some stories from folks in the Alliance about, um, like Justin, I, I recall about just empowering the staff to be able to turn out the lights, empowering the security to be able to turn out the lights made a significant difference. What are some of those stories that you found along the way where it actually didn't take a huge investment, but you actually were able to, to really deliver some meaningful impact reduction? Can think of any stories to share there? Yeah, I'll, I'll share one right off the bat uh, that comes to mind. Um, and this is when I think one of the uh, hallmarks of, of your program, when you, when you know it's working, uh, one of our frontline plumbers came to us and said, you know, if we put this, I think it's a diaphragm or something, I don't really understand how it works, but all I know is he came to us and said, for about five cents a unit, we can cut the water usage in half in, in the men's rooms. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I like those easy ones. Those are good. Volley those right back, right? Um, you know, because we had looked, uh, as the Miami Heat looked at, or American Airlines Arena looked at, uh, the waterless urinal route. And that's a tremendous capital investment to go that route. This was a, an incredibly inexpensive way to cut a lot of our water usage uh, in the restrooms in half. So these are some of those frontline, hey, did you, and by the way, somebody mentioned it in the panel earlier, and, and maybe I kind of skimmed my first answer, so if I can, I just want to loop it back in. We did create a culture, and, and Scott and I, and, and one other gentleman, Dave Durenberger, created a culture where, you know, we had a plan, we painted a future picture, we said this is what success looks like to the staff, and the more you paint that picture and the more vivid you paint that picture, you've given them essentially permission to come to the table and say, you know, because we, we really preach, this is not going to be something that's done to you, it's going to be done with you, and we really need your expertise. Uh, so they came back, and once they were educated, and, and it was clear on what our goals were, um, they would come back and we would do things like this, uh, this diaphragm and, and watch the water usage and we would measure and we would see those results happen. And then we would celebrate internally um, and, and make a big deal out of that person that brought it. And don't you know, the next guy that shows up, and you know, this is a little bit off topic of energy, but we had a frontline cleaner who, you know, got out of high school and, and went right to work and, and came to us and said, I know a way that we can increase our recycling dramatically. And, you know, it was just by using our partners at the baseball team and using the parking lots and cleaning up in a certain way. And that's a frontline guy that, that we celebrated and made sure we made a big deal about. But to us, the fuel are two things, motivation and momentum. And that's what fuels this thing. So once that culture is there uh, and you, you're executing and you're measuring and you're making adjustments and you're celebrating, it really becomes this thing that now in 2010, or 2012, listen to me, 2012, where it somebody joining the organization. Now, this is just something we do. Somebody mentioned earlier, I've also been part of the four-and-a-half-year-old lecture uh, my daughter gave me on not recycling. So it's just something my daughter's going to do, and my 10-month-old son's going to do the same thing because he just it's what he's been exposed to. So uh, we try to create that environment, and we think once that environment's created, all of these outgrowths happen where a frontline person comes and says, I've got an idea, and then celebrate it. And Jackie, Scott, some of you? Well, I'll just add, the, you know, in the power of this what we're working on is when you can do that within the culture of an organization within a sports venue, imagine the power of that when you take that to the public. Because they're going to see us doing it in Miami, they're going to see us doing it in Philadelphia, they're going to see us doing it in Portland, in St. Louis, and it's becoming a new norm. And we need to define that and show people that it's successful financially, it's successful environmentally. And, you know, it, it, it's just a hard change to break the old habits. And, you know, a couple of things I've seen in the last year as I tour new facilities, you can see investments in major renovations or new construction, and you go in the restroom and to what Leonard was talking about, the urinal. I mean, why are we flushing a gallon of potable water down the urinal every time someone uses the restroom? It makes no sense, right? You can put in a pint flush urinal at the exact same upfront cost and use one eighth of the water. So why isn't that the new normal? And, and somehow we've got to get out there and say, guys, that is the new normal to architects, to engineers, to contractors. That's, that's the standard of today. Waterless, you know, there's debate over, you know, some people like it, some people don't. But a pint flush over a gallon, that's a no-brainer. So hopefully what we can do is define what that new normal is and seize all those opportunities. And culturally is really where you bake it into the system. And there's all kinds of benefits to your employees and to your organization and then to your fans. And from there, the power is dramatic. Uh, well, at the arena, the few low cost, no cost, as we like to call them there, initiatives that we've taken on are things as simple as the five cent aerator. For example, we changed all of our paper towels and all of our toilet paper to EPA rated recycled content or full recycled, 100% recycled paper it didn't cost us anything. It was the exact same price as the regular stuff that's out on the market. Um, 
our copy paper, it's the same thing. We up the recycled content. It costs maybe two cents more. Uh, Ream, we went through with that. Post-its, office supplies, all of these things that we take for granted on a day-to-day -day basis in the office, all of these are real <laughs> efficient cost savings that we were able to see. And just by that, now we are, the last numbers I have are 43% of our dollars spent on office supplies and on paper products and toiletries is has recycled content in it and goes towards the credits that we use to get the LEED certification. Um, we've been taking out all of our light bulbs, switching out our light bulbs, something else that's low cost, no cost. We um, went from the original bulbs to compact fluorescence and now we're transitioning into LEDs. I'm sure, um, as most of you know, LEDs um, don't always transition into every single type of bulb that we have in our arenas and our stadium. So as that technology becomes available, we are transitioning out of that. Um, that's a little bit more expensive, but again, when it comes down to the life of the light bulb and how much money is going into replacing bulbs, that in itself is going to save us money in the long term. Um, something else we did, low cost, no cost. Uh, we entered into a partnership deal with Crystalline Filtration, eliminated the bottled water consumption from our office staff. We have about 200 full-time employees. Mm -hmm. And um, in two years alone, when we ran the numbers with the staff that purchases that, we had ordered um, just over 10,000 cases of bottled water for employee use only. This is not in the concessions. So by eliminating that and bringing in a water filtration system, water coolers set up in all the office areas, we were able to divert. Um, the plastic comes out to about five and a half tons when you do the math on those 10,000 cases of water. Those are huge numbers diverted from the waste stream, from something as simple as switching over to a water cooler. Um, our food and beverage vendors have switched to corn-based plastic cups in all of our premium areas. Um, they're compostable if we ever choose to go that route. We're not there yet, but it's there. But when it goes to the landfill, it is biodegradable, so we don't have to worry about creating more uh, waste in the landfills. And we've also transitioned into recycled napkins, recycled food containers. Um, all of those are on the cost side, small investments that lead up to big numbers in the end. That's great. Anything to add, Joe? Or, yeah, we've uh, done just, much yeah, the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Very <laughs> simple. Just, just a couple, couple, couple of things. Uh, Martin mm -hmm. uh, alluded to something that a program that we did. This, this, this is all a matter of perspective um, for me. And I think for us, we figured that out. Um, little things like um, asking your security agents who roam the office tower at night to just turn off lights. 38% reduction in energy load. That's simple. When it's raining, um, install water sensors so your lawns aren't using irrigated bottled water. Mm -hmm. That's pretty simple. Um, use chemical-free um, um, cooling tower systems. These are simple. Asking your fans to engage with and participate with recycling and giving them the opportunity to recycle in your venues. That's pretty simple. Lead certification sounds really complicated. Sometimes it gets a really bum rap out in the industry because, oh, it's so complicated, it's gonna cost so much money. It's a matter of perspective. It's actually really easy. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. Um, these are things that, um, you know, when we talk about low-hanging fruit and a payback of something like an energy project that pays back in eight months, it's a no-brainer. Lead certification sounds more difficult, but it's a matter of perspective. All these things actually are very easy to achieve. And you know, we hope, I think, through this movement that we're showing with, with sports stadiums, arenas, venues, convention centers, that we, if we can do it, you can do it in your commercial building, you can do it in your home. Sorry, well, one, um, you know, one, uh, one question for you all. I know that um, sometimes when you think of a sports venue and a sports team, it feels like just a single entity. <clears throat> Um, to those of us as fans, you know, you just kind of look at the venue, just see the venue and the team. Um, but there's also, there's five or six companies that are coming together to be able to run that facility, make those decisions. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the crucial role that your partners play, that these other um, companies that are involved with, uh, have been involved with in the success of these ventures? Yeah, do you, do you want to keep going the route or go the way? Start yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Could give me a chance right. to think. Yeah, it's, you know, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is a, it's a group, that, you know, typically you've got the team or the ownership group that runs the building, but uh, generally the concessions is a major operation. Sometimes you outsource the, the Apple operation or you're back of the house. 
Uh, so you, you've got a lot of partners to come together. So certainly uh, from our standpoint, we have Delaware North and St. Louis and Delaware North, like many of the other major concessionaires in sports, uh, Aramark being another, have wonderful programs. Delaware North has got a green track program that they're very proud of and they put in place in just about all their buildings. I know they've got ISO certification in many of their facilities. I think Cleveland's got it and San Diego, they're working on it in our building, which is that environmental ISO certification. So they're, they're a big part of that. And, and for us, it's, it's very important because so much of the energy we use is to handle the, the food and beverage products that they have. Uh, outside of the, the, the space cooling that we have in the building, uh, probably refrigeration load for food and for beverage and freezers they have are probably one of the next largest things. That's something I'd love to be mm -hmm. able to get our handle on a little bit better, but I mm -hmm. think that's where it's at. So we need their help to make that happen. And then again, it's simple things like, you know, curtains on freezer doors and, and just, just trying to uh, be efficient on how you use that. How long do you keep a refrigerator on in between home stands, when do you make ice? Uh, those sort of simple operational decisions, you need the operator, the, the concession operator to help you. And we're very proud of the arrangement that we've got with Delaware North and St. Louis, it's helping it make it work. Uh, but then in turn, uh, another big partner, I think when it comes, uh, certainly your energy partners, there's a lot of uh, uh, energy uh, uh, providers and energy uh, uh, companies out there that are sponsors of sport and so they are are uh, a great resource. Uh, your waste management, uh, or I don't want to, shouldn't throw out that name as a particular name, but whoever hauls your trash. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're a great resource for bringing their expertise. And in particular, I'll say waste management because they're, again, our waste hauler in St. Louis. And I know they're very active in, in the Green Sports Alliance and very active in, in their efforts to promoting. So yeah. it, it takes that whole group to come together to really be able to to drive it home across the board. You just can't do it uh, alone because it's, it's, there, there's so many other people to come together. And getting that group together, having them participate in your green team uh, it goes a long way and, and keeps you, it just kind of sells it through. Hmm. It's one thing to talk about in the meeting room. It's what's going on at the trash dock. I mean, I think Scott, you and I have shared stories about you know, you think you got to figure it out, but the guy at the end of the at the end of the line <laughs> is sitting there. Okay, I got this big haul of cardboard. I throw it in this can or that can, and it can all be defeated if he's just lazy and throws it in the wrong can. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's stuff like that, and it takes that involvement of all those groups to to be an effective program. That's great. Other examples of partnership. Yeah, and, and you know, Joe, when you mentioned the trash room, we've rebranded it now. We're we're getting focused on the recycling center. So it's no longer the trash room; it's a resource. Well, we're not making it go away. Like do, yeah. <laughs> I still have a lot of trash. <laughs> There's value in there. We're trying to, to reuse. So um, so we've rebranded it around the uh, recycling center. And and Martin, your question is a good one because sustainability gives you an opportunity to bring all kinds of stakeholders in your building together around a common cause. And when you look at our zero waste initiative that we have now, and again, that's another mind shift change, zero waste. And I hesitated for years. Uh, five years ago, I, I thought 50% would be a big number in recycling in our venues, and I really didn't know how we'd get beyond that. And then the Giants showed us that you could do it. Uh, and then they showed us that you can do it even higher. And, and now you've got people like the Pirates that are in the 60s, Justin's building. Did I hear 90? Verging on 90. We're, we're in the mid 80s, shooting for 90. I mean, so it, it, the, really the mindset change around zero waste has been uh, really amazing. Um, but when you bring the stakeholders together to make that happen in our buildings, uh, it's the supply chain. It's where you're buying the, the cups and the forks and the, and the straws. Uh, it's your composter that you've got to send all this organic material to to get it composted. It's the compostable bag company, EcoSafe, that makes a bag that composts. Um, it's Aramark that does our housekeeping. That is the guy at the end of the, the road that puts it in the right container. Uh, center plate that does our food service that has to buy the right kind of packaging and serviceware. Um, and then the fun part about it is when you can really uh, pull that together and start to tell the story in the ballpark and make it part of the entertainment package. And we've been fortunate to have a great partner in BASF. Uh, we have a BASF Kid Compost trivia game that we run on 10 sustainable Saturdays throughout the season. 
And, and so now it's part of the entertainment and it's part of the fun. And each Saturday we can talk about a sustainable initiative, whether it's water, whether it's energy, construction materials, composting. Um, so we've really brought that conversation to, to the front of the house, to the fans, and at the same time brought all these stakeholders together around something we can really celebrate, which is our zero waste initiative and our recycling. So um, it, it, it's a, it, there's lots of opportunities in sustainability. I have one uh, philosophical point as it relates to this and then one anecdote that I wanted to add to that. But the, philosophically, I think for a long time there was a decision to be made, do you want to be profitable or green? And I think now um, capitalism has lined up with green and given it the traction, in this one person's opinion, to really give it some juice and move it in the right direction. Um, and I think just that component alone has caught the attention of a lot of people. Uh, today isn't about being profitable, it's about growth. Uh, are you more profitable than last year? So these guys are looking everywhere. And uh, if, if I had a way to, uh, to save you money in, in buying certain things, and, and oh, by the way, you can be environmentally responsible at the same time, um, that's a good thing. And, and, and we try to put as many examples of that together as possible. Um, a lot of the same vendors and a lot of us up here um, are challenged by the service partner relationship. And I think it starts in the, in the negotiating room when you're negotiating the contract. Is the language in the contract? Are you really serious about it? Are you going to measure it? Are you going to audit it? Are you going to reward and penalize uh, financially or some other way uh, that motivates? Uh, unfortunately, you need that carrot and stick sometimes. Uh, but one quick anecdote I'd like to share with you. Uh, we uh, thought we were really smart and went out and did a recycling program at our stadium and uh, spent a lot of time, went to Disney, uh, learned that no trash can should be uh, further than uh, 26 paces apart because um, someone actually handed out candy and measured. Imagine that. <laughs> Mom, Dad, I work for Disney and I counted how many steps somebody took and threw it on the ground. But they measured that and then they put their trash cans that far apart and sure enough, saved on cleaning costs. They made it easy for the guests to participate in the program of recycling and we did the same thing. We just modeled that. Uh, put it in our stadium and that happened. So we thought we were really smart. We get the recyclables downstairs and what does the guy do? He throws it right in the dumpster and it goes right off to the landfill. So uh, they got some nice clean recyclables sitting in a landfill somewhere in uh, beautiful southeastern uh, Pennsylvania. So what we decided to do was uh, put a blue bag in a blue uh, recycling uh, shaped, bottle shaped uh, uh, container. Uh, the blue bag goes in a blue uh, tilt cart which goes downstairs to a dumpster that you can only imagine what color we had it painted. It's blue. So um, even I could do this, right? So um, we saw the numbers shoot up. We have uh, numbers everywhere. We share and celebrate the results. We take uh, the money from the recycling program that we get back and we fund incentive programs with it. Um, our cleaning crew who cleaned the parking lot, uh, the only time they probably ever saw the inside of a suite was when they cleaned it. And uh, we made sure to hire an outside firm to come in and clean the lot one night and send them over to the Phillies uh, and put them in a suite and catered the whole thing and, and let those guys bring their families and have a really good time. Um, you know, it's, it's things like that, little tokens like that, that show them that we're serious about it. We're going to put our money where our mouth is on it. Uh, and we're not afraid to be wrong. We're not afraid to admit when we're wrong. We're not afraid to make evaluations and adjust. And uh, I think that's just one example of how you get your service partners to understand why you're doing it. And once they understand why, the how is so much easier, it, rather than just dictating to them, you will do it or you'll jump in a dumpster and clean it. You know, that, it's just not really the way to, to do it. We tried that. You know, I was guilty of that just as much as the other guy because I wanted those numbers. But when we spent more time on why, and we took Aramark out to the recycling center and had them do a presentation to some of the frontline managers, some of the hourly employees, and they understood. They were like, wow, this, all right, now that makes sense. And they come back and they're passionate about it. And you just saw the, 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 the compliance, the buy-in, just the, just go up exponentially. Martin, if I, if I could, um, you know, in addition to sports teams and venues being icons and leaders of our communities, um, you know, we are a marketing company. I mean, that, 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 that is what we do. It's, this, this is part of our industry. And with that comes lots of partners. These partners help us in everything that we do. And, you know, when you think about um, how we envision this form of a, a sustainable approach when we think about our business, Things have changed quite dramatically over the last 10 years when we think about these authentic partners that are actually with and married to sports teams and venues now in our communities. Um, whether we have um, you know, allied waste or stock market um, or Pacific Power um, or Corex Utilities helping us, you know, trying to achieve our, our um, objectives, we have public partners such as the NRDC that we, we go to now and we say, 
we're thinking of partnering with this company that's going to help us with our goals and, 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 and kind of do some community activation and engagement. What do you think about that? These are policies written in our company now that say we will meet these criteria when it comes to sustainable purchasing. Things have shifted quite dramatically. Ann Kelly's here from BICEP, Business, Businesses for Innovative Climate Energy Policy. We are a member. And a lot of people ask the question, why is a professional sports team a member of an organization that is actively on Capitol Hill legislating for change? It's because it's important. The partners that are actually associated with BICEP are ones that we, will, you know, we want to partner with as well. We go to Ann Kelly and we say, we're thinking about Company X. What do you think about them? And sometimes we don't get great results and answers from Ann and from Alan. Mm -hmm. And we make those tough decisions to, to look the other way. So I think we've had a lot of very great discussion. We wanted to make sure that you all out in the audience had a chance to, to ask a couple questions. Um, over there in the purple. So for for the audience that's for the audience that's not here in the room to try to summarize that a little bit, maybe just talk about how uh, you've you've worked to engage your fans around these issues, and then also have you been able to, to leverage the, the power and the celebrity of your your players in order to be able to get people engaged in these issues? Can, can I start with a quick one? Sure. Just on the player side of it, and I know we've got some people, some folks here from Players for the Planet, and there's some other groups out there, Fit Planet. Um, the, the talent side of this is, it should really be the face of the movement. We're operations people and we're making things happen and we're developing these platforms to tell stories from. You know, and our brands are huge, our venues are iconic structures, but when we can tie into the, the, the talent side of the messaging, that's really when we're gonna hit the sweet spot. So that's really a, a call to action out there to, to the athletes out there, to the players, if you will, to the race car drivers. Um, we wanna find out who's environmentally minded and hopefully through the Green Sports Alliance, players through the planet, whatever, we can, we can get together and really have powerful messaging because that's, that's really what we need to do. And, and what we did was uh, at the Eagles that we were fortunate enough that our, our jersey color matched the movement. So um, the, the whole Go Green uh, movement um, for us, uh, we started uh, to celebrate the fan. And uh, we... <laughs> I can't believe we're talking this much about urinals at the White House, but um, we, we've had fun with the messaging. Uh, we have a very large sign over a bank of urinals that says, you know, recycle your beer here, but, you know, you know put your cops and bottles in the right receptacle. You know, it's, it's having fun with the message. It's guy humor. Sorry, I couldn't help it. But uh, we're thinking of one for the ladies' room, if anybody's got one. But um, we thought it was a fun way to present the message. We, again, it was very important to us not to appear preachy on this because people will shut you down. Look, I, I, <laughs> when I speak to people, I tell them I could not, when Scott got to our building, I could not have been further from this movement. 
I, I am shocked I'm sitting here, right? And my friends would card me right now if they saw me up here. <laughs> so I've learned as I went. And, and what I learned was, boy, this, this example's outdated too. It's kind of shades of gray, right? Sorry. But <laughs> it has to move on a path, right? It has to change as it goes. And, and it's not going to be an all or nothing. And don't let perfection get in the way of, of progress. And, and, and it's OK not to be 100%. And because I always looked at it in the, in the beginning as, you know, and the reason I'm telling you all this is because of the way we present our message. I always looked at this as, you know, if we could just get rid of all the human beings, we'll be fine. And that just wasn't an option for me, right? I'm having too much fun. So when, when they presented it in a way that was about movement and progress and, and don't let perfection get in the way, we took our messaging that way and had a lot of fun with it. You know, trash the giants and redskins and cowboys, but recycle your cups. You know, it's, it's tying in football. It's weaving it through the tapestry of your business and making it not this forced thing, but just something that's kind of part of what we do. And, uh, and the messaging, we've had a lot of fun with it. And, and as Scott mentioned, the player side, you know, that, they come and go. And, and when you get one that's, you know, maybe raised on, on the West Coast and, and really takes this to heart, <laughs> That's unfortunately the way it's been, right? But someday, somebody's going to be born. Somebody mentioned in Virginia, right? We saw the pirates say it. In Virginia, they too care about the environment, right? So when, when they come in, right, and they start to embrace it, we love that. And, and Scott's right. That's the juice. Because when the fans see the player, like David Ortiz or whoever, throw it in the right receptacle, that means something to the fan. So we've just had fun with the messaging. I hope that answers. Absolutely. Let me get a couple other responses. Okay. Well, um, when you think about Miami, where we are, responsible is not what comes to mind, right? It's the nightlife, it's the clubbing, it's the beaches. Um, so we really took it upon ourselves to put this message out to our community and let them know that there is a chance to be responsible. Um, and we have gotten the players involved on some of the initiatives we do during the NBA Green Week. We do the beach sweep. Um, it's become an annual event since our certification, and the players come out and participate participate with the community. They designate a beach. We go out. We clean it with the community, with the players, with some of the staff members. Um, we did an e-recycling with Waste Management, who is our um, hauling provider at the arena, um, where we invited the community to come to the arena on a game day, um, either during the day or during the game, drop off their electronics. And all of that went to benefit the Miami-Dade School Board. Um, they're collecting electronics to try to cash them in with an incentive program that the state has so that they can bring technology into the schools. Mm. Um, we were very adamant in participating in that and promoting it. We had truckloads of electronics go out, thankfully, so it was very successful. Um, we created the reheat program with our community intervention department, and it's similar to what was discussed on the earlier panel where we recycle all of the the hot food from our premium areas, our catered areas, all of that food goes to a designated shelter at the end of every event night. They come up, they pick it up, it turns around. It's turned into hundreds of meals for the homeless. Homeless is a huge issue in Miami, and we are in downtown, so it helps to affect a lot of the different areas that are there, the different shelters that we have close by. And we also got the, the fans involved by putting the dream machine. It's a machine that Pepsi has where you turn in your bottles or your cans and you get points. And those points can be redeemed for coupons at tons of vendors. There's hundreds of vendors on the website. And all of the, the money that they get from turning around those recyclables goes into uh, the Veterans Dreams Project, which helps to fund needy veterans. And just beyond that, we've been able to reach over 200 million fans with our in-house branding. Our lead certification was branded. It's all over our uh, Medusa, as we call our jumbotron, I guess, mm -hmm. as you guys refer to it. It's on our media mesh on the exterior facade of the building. So everyone that drives by on Biscayne Boulevard sees our lead logo, sees that we are partnered with Waste Management, and that we take sustainability seriously, which is something that we need to promote in Miami. And we need to make it relevant to the community and see that it's, if a sports environment can do it and can achieve it, then there's no reason why you can't be doing it in your own homes. That's great. Maybe go out for another question. Uh, here. Jason Quill, Vulcan Inc. Um, looking at the environmental footprint of sports teams, and one of the largest pieces of that pie is the fan impact traveling to and from these venues. So I wonder if you can touch upon the transportation programs, how you're engaging the cities you're in, the municipalities, on getting fans out of the cars and public transportation, on bikes. 
to these events. Yeah, I'll, it, it, if I could, I, and, and, and to kind of carry over from the last question, I think, I think we can't overlook community fan engagement, um, and, and transportation is a great um, element of that. Um, you know, we, you've heard me talk a little bit about business case, and there's environmental footprint benefits, um, there's brand enhancement benefits for all of our teams. This, this whole, how do we leverage the power and influence of sports to sort of change behavior and get values, um, you, know, you know, looking at the, the norm. The norm is this is more of a sustainable living from a community standpoint. Um, when you think about, um, and, you know, engagement, here's the thing, we were asking people to uh, participate in renewable energy programs. We're offsetting, you should be offsetting too. We're asking you to change out light bulbs, we've done it, you should do it as well. Transportation is one of the hardest pieces. When I talked about that carbon footprint earlier, 70% of our carbon footprint, which is going to be very similar to every venue um, and every team across the world, 70% is related to transportation impact. So people driving to and from, getting to and from, even when they use transit, there's a carbon in impact to that. And your employees that are coming back and forth to our venues. So how do you tackle that? It's, it's not as easy as an eight month payback on a lighting retrofit. So some of the things we've done, and I'm very encouraged by this, um, Anne mentioned the electric vehicle charging stations. We're paying and pa paving the way for that infrastructure so that those can, uh, people that want to get out and actually own an electric vehicle or a hybrid so electric can get out and do it and actually get to our events, charge up and leave for the day. That's a gigantic win. Um, investments in public transportation. So making that actual, um, you know, we, we've actually um, self-attached uh, ourselves to build the infrastructure of light rail and streetcar and bus systems, those are the things that, that we're up to. We're, we're trying to subsidize our employee travel so that they can actually you know, purchase transit. One thing that um, is probably the most exciting for me and for us, and a very good um, look at the power and influence of sports, is biking. So Portland, Oregon is Bike City, USA. Bike City, maybe, in the nation. Um, you know, and we're, and we're, we're very proud of who we are as a, as a community. When you were to look at, before we started these initiatives, how many people bike to Blazer Games? You had about 20 bikes. How is that possible? In Bike City, USA, we only had about 20 people biking per game. So we put a small amount of infrastructure investment in biking. New racks, covered bike racks, some lighting, bike pump, things like that. But we evoked our fans. We said, we want you, we encourage you to bike to Blazers. Let's hold an event called Bike to Blazers so that you can actually come and all rally and be a part of this. We, we, we went from 20 bikes a game to 100 overnight to 200. Now we're nearing 300. We need to install more bike racks because every game now, not just Bike to Blazers game, but every game people are biking. This is the kind of stuff that I think is really interesting about this movement and that, that influence that we can have. Now, we haven't pulled, but some of those folks are probably now biking to work because they're actually realizing that getting from their home down to the central city is a very easy task. Mm, that's great. Question in the back? Yes, uh, thanks for taking my question. This is the wrong side of the screen. Um, my question is similar to the previous question, but from the perspective of other stadiums, um, energy consultants, which we are, um, is, are there plans to have some sort of a sustainability dashboard, if you will, showcase all these good stories we're hearing, uh, transparency of data for others waiting on the sideline to be able to follow your input steps. Maybe we'll start with Scott. Or... You know, I, we, we need to do more of that. We need to be transparent. <laughs> I think we're really riding with the training wheels on right now. Yeah. And you know, we started and Joe collected the data for MLB four years ago on recycling. That was the first time that I know of that we had a league-wide initiative to track data. And, uh, and it was very illuminating, and, and it created that, that, comp that competition amongst our, our, our fellow teams. And, um, and since then, we've rolled that into an MLB program called Green Track, where we're, we're tracking energy, water, recycling, and paper procurement. And we, as you've heard earlier, we've got a long ways to go. We need to get people to put the data in so we get good benchmarking. We need, but, it, but it's already driving behavior on the recycling front. Recycling rates have gone way up within baseball. Now, I don't think we're ready to share that. And, and to a, another comment somebody said, uh, I don't, there's going to be hesitation to show the standings, if you will, because nobody wants to be on the, on the wrong end of that. <laughs> but I think the power of it will be when baseball can say, hey, you know, four years ago we had a recycling rate of 15 percent, and today we're at 30 percent, and next year we're at 35 percent. So it's more the direction we're going as a group that I think the real value will be, be in. And, and you know, Energy Star Portfolio Manager 
it's right there. What's your energy intensity? It's, it's plain as day for everybody to see. So um, there, that is very powerful, and, and we do need to do more of that. Yeah, right, right now, uh, at least within Major League Baseball, it's such a small sample set of the data. We, we, we've only we've got 30 teams. Uh, with the Energy Star data, we've got about 10 to 12 of the teams that have got their data in there correct that we can, can really start understanding. And, and we're really starting uh, within some of the work that we're doing with the EPA and the Energy Star people, uh, with the, uh, the Green Sports Alliance, we've got that energy focus group uh, where we've got some stadium managers and others. Uh, we're starting to look at issues like that so that we can help draw some better conclusions and, and have some uh, cumulative data. Uh, you know, EPA Portfolio Man is a great example. They've been doing this for buildings for years and years, and commercial buildings are well established restaurants, hospitals, mm -hmm. uh, they, they've got, the data's been there for years. Stadiums, <laughs> it's just not there. Arenas, we're just not there yet. We're just now starting to collect that data to the point where we can understand what it takes to run a building and what a good building would run at. What's mm -hmm. that KBTU per square foot? What's that energy intensity? And, and so that's something as we work with G GSA and EPA on this focus group, we hope to be able to become more transparent so that we can uh, talk about this data the way hospitals and other commercial and retail outlets talk about their Energy Star status because we just don't have that Energy Star ability to cr you know create that calculation just yet. We're getting there. Right. We're taking the spirit of the President's commitment to new media, new media and the digital age. We're going to take a Twitter uh, question. And this one's actually from Kevin Abernathy. Oh, God. <laughs> Joe's son. <laughs> I made the mistake well done, of Kevin. Kevin. Is there. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Send it to somebody else. This is going to be our, I believe, our last question of the, of the session. What will it take to get teams on the low end of the spectrum to get to the level of the teams here? Oh, I can. He's calling you out. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll, I'll start. I'll go ahead. Fine question. Um, I think it builds off of what Justin was saying earlier, where everyone has this idea that LEED, which is the third party certification, which is great. I mean, we can all be sustainable, but it's great to have that kind of recognition from a third party, is this overwhelming task. And it really isn't when you get down to the bones of it. Um, I can speak from experience because I was a project manager for our LEED certification. We did everything in-house. Our VP of Operations, Jim Spencer, was on the team. Our Director of Ops, Emerson Figueroa, was on the team. Our Ops Manager, Manny Ramos. Between us four, we were able to do the LEED certification within a matter of six months. No consultancy firm, um, no, um, no extensive outside help. We had some help from our um, paper uh, procurement people, Dade Paper, which are fantastic. They helped us figure out the recycled content in our paper, in our soaps, all of those little things that went into a few of the credits. Um, waste management helped with the waste audit to see where we were recycling, which was not acceptable to us. We were only at about 4% diversion from our waste stream because we were only doing cardboard. So with that, we've been able to get, we're not quite into your percentages yet because our program's only about a year and a half in, but we are already in the 20s. So we've seen a huge increase from that 4% in the beginning. And we were able to do all of this internally, and we want to put that message out there to people that um, you can do it. It can be done. And it's so helpful to have that kind of third-party recognition when you go out to help build your business. It can attract people that maybe wouldn't have looked at you or, or there was some kind of competition who had that edge over you. We have artists that are sustainable that are on the green front that we've been able to attract to the arena to perform there because of our lead certification. Hmm. And we've been able to enter in all these new sponsorships to help grow the business and grow the image of the American Airlines Arena and the Miami Heat. So the most important message here is that it can be done, you can do it, and you don't need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on consultants to do it if you have that history in your building and you have that data already. We baselined our data, we've tracked it. I have 10 years worth of data on all of our utilities, on all of our expenses. It's tracked, our peaks are used for our projections to make sure that we never hit those peaks again and stay within those limits. So we have that track record. And if you have that data, if you have that benchmarking, it's completely within the realm of reality that all of your different organizations can do it in-house.
This is this is, you know, two of the uh, funding organizations um, from the from or founding organizations for the Green Sports Alliance was the Seattle Seahawks, Sounders, and uh, the Portland Trailblazers. Paul Allen's commitment to this is exactly what this question is, is evoking. Um, you know, we need to share these best practices. We need to pave a way that others, such um, as, as other other teams that haven't really got there yet, it gives them an opportunity, roadmap, an easy way to go to one place to sort of yes. understand what they can do and what they can achieve. I talked about business case. So when you start talking about those business case economics, this is not a right or left conversation. Mm -hmm. This is something that when we want to bring these barriers down, that business case should easily be um, a, a very easy inroad. There's an environmental benefit to this as well. That's something that all of us in our industry can talk about to our community. There's new partners, new sponsors that can be brought on because of these movements. There is a brand enhancement that can happen um, there's, an, a, there's a community goodwill element that comes out of this. These are all reasons that these barriers should be um, becoming lower and lower for professional sports teams across the country and in North America. Can I just build on something right that he just said, uh, Justin just said, it, it is a number of things for a number of people, so how do you get the bottom uh, to come up? Well, the first thing is don't make the assumption that they don't care or don't want to. They may just not know how to. Um, so each person has a different motivator. Some is uh, financial, as you mentioned. Some are, uh, like our ownership, wants to take advantage of the position they think they're in with the brand and a responsibility that goes with that uh, recognition. Um, some, uh, it was mentioned on the earlier panel, it's just the competitive nature of this business. You know, I'm going to build a, a bigger screen and I'm going to hang it from the middle of the stadium and, you know, and look at that. And then the next guy's going to go, well, watch this. And, you know, and it's, you know, a lot of that. And if it all fuels the right movement, who cares, right? So um, the NFL, for example, has an ownership meeting um, and it's not intended to uh, get anybody competitive, but they like to share all the grades uh, among uh, 32 owners who have zero ego at all, right? And uh, they just want to share data and they'll rank you and show you where you are. And you can only imagine what Monday after that meeting looks like if you're on the bottom third, right? So um, whatever it takes. But us, um, I, I'm real proud to say, look, when I was growing up in the 70s, there was a little owl telling me just to throw stuff in a trash can, right, not on the street. And now we're up here talking about uh, solar film and wind and turning corn into NASCAR fuel. And you know, it's, 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 it's awesome to watch the journey, right? So we used our own numbers in en energy con conservation as we started the panel with. And as those numbers went down, we just kept scratching, going, what's next, what's next, what's next? And a company came to us and said, we'll tell you, your, well, your building, your property is like a tree, and we'd like to hang a lot of things on it to help you create energy. Uh, we're going we're gonna to fix your energy costs over the next 20 years, and we're going to uh, use our business model to sell the power uh, to the power grid and all that and make their money. But you're going to save money, we're going to make money, and then we're going to do a marketing partnership with you. Are you in? Come on, you know, <laughs> yes, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we went ahead and, and started, and as the time got closer to put a shovel in the ground, they realized that they were probably a little bigger eyes than, than, than uh, reality could support. So then another group came in, and because that conversation was started, they said, yeah, but how about this? And then the next project came to us, and it's actually greener than the initial project. So I'm proud to say we just put a shovel in the ground to build a four megawatt uh, power plant, basically, of solar and wind, um, we're going to have 11,000 solar panels around the facility. We're going to have 14 wind turbines. Um, and we're going to provide our, basically, fix our energy costs for the next 20 years. That's going to save the team $32 million mm -hmm. with an M, right? <laughs> so thank you. But I, I, I really do say that not to impress you. Well, maybe a little. Not to impress you, but, but to impress upon anybody listening that, that who's next? All right, we put one stake in the ground and, and you know, somebody put another stake in the ground and, and you know, we, that's how recycling gets up to 99% diversion rate. That's how it gets there. We started at 15, we're at 99, right? 100 would be egomaniac, that's why we're staying at 99. <laughs> but so it, it's moving and it's, and it's hearing from this, the, the uh, Mariners and it's hearing from our friends at the Cardinals and the Heat and everybody else because we're all competitive. It's the nature of our business. So that's, that's what I think is really great about the whole movement. Well, it's been a great panel, but I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. Um, I personally couldn't be more excited <laughs> about what you guys are all doing and the opportunities we have going forward. You know, within my own office, the Department of Energy, we have a $2 billion a year budget, uh, a whole network of relationships and technical expertise on the deployment side. And I, I'll commit here today to dramatically dial up our engagement with the, the Green Sports Alliance and with this community. I'm looking very forward 
to working with you on that. Mm -hmm. um, with that, let's thank the Green Sports Alliance and Martin and all these fantastic uh, sports clean energy leaders for everything they do and uh, look forward to seeing what we can do together going forward. Thank you. Thank you.